right. Um, Hello, um, my name is Jenny Prentisso. I am a coordinating wildlife biologist with Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever here in Nebraska. And today I'm gonna to talk to you about uh, bird surveys. Um, we as wildlife biologists, we conduct a lot of bird surveys throughout the year um, on a variety of different species. And these are things that anyone can do really, as long as you're familiar with the sounds and, this, uh, with the sounds and uh, what species you're serving. Um, so I'm going to give a very brief overview of how you could do one yourself. So uh, first off, what are bird surveys for? Um, in general, uh, biologists and uh, game, uh, wildlife agencies are collecting data for a variety of purposes. Sometimes we're looking for long-term trends in a particular species or a group of species, um, just to see how, um, you know, are those populations, are they going up, are they going down, or, you know, what are they doing? And some of these trends can be indicators of the habitat quality, you know, what does the grasslands look like? Um, what are the wetlands looking like? You know, if the populations remain stable or increase, typically the habitat is doing well. Um, we also look for trends in some specific species populations, um, you know, maybe local, you know, you know, maybe localized populations, you know, even on a county level or even smaller, just, you know, kind of in a general area. And um, in some cases, um, some biologists will be able to, to band uh, birds. And whenever uh, someone is able to read off the band of those birds, they report that data to the appropriate agency. And then we can actually get data on one particular individual of a species. And uh, that information has become quite valuable uh, for, for a lot of different species across the US. So the first thing you wanna do if you are interested in setting up a survey is first see if you can find and locate some uh, local experts. Those could be local wildlife biologists, maybe you can contact uh, Game of Parks uh, or even the University of Nebraska. They often have students who may need help with some projects. Um, and they can kind of help you uh, help you get started and maybe even get you in on uh, maybe some current surveys that are going on. Or maybe you want to just do a survey for your own property and they can tell you the best way to do it for yourself. Um, the next uh, thing you want to do is identify the correct areas to survey. Most of the time, if you're doing a survey with another organization, they'll kind of set up those spots for you. Um, but if you're trying to set this up yourself or on your neighborhood or on your own property, um, you want to identify these places. You want to uh, select areas that are first off safe to survey. You know, um, you know, surveying off of a blacktop busy road is sometimes not always the most safe. You know, so if you can get off the side of the road, that's preferable. Um, you know, make sure you have permission. You know, if you're going to go on private lands, make sure you have permission to be surveying those sites. Um, and also try to identify areas that are you know, ideal habitat hotspots for your species of interests. And then also, you know, you want to review some sort of survey protocol. Um, many of our bird surveys are usually done uh, around sunrise to a couple hours after sunrise, concluding about 9 a.m. And there are a handful of surveys that occur in the evening. Um, again, make sure you get land permission and very, you know, as much as you can, become familiar with the species you're surveying. So if you're trying to survey for a whole suite of grassland songbirds, you know, make sure you're, you're doing well with your, your bird ID, especially the males, um, and then become familiar with the various calls that these species um, can make. And whenever you can, minimize the disturbance. So make sure you're stepping out of your car, you're turning off your car, um, you're, you're not gonna be around busy, busy highways when you can avoid it. Um, and any other place where there's going to be anything else. Um, the idea is to really capture uh, the animals when they're doing their, their natural thing, you know, and the more we can reduce our disturbance to them, the better off that, that will be. So equipment, well, you really don't need a whole lot um, to do a bird survey, um, just kind of your, your know-how. Um, although a pair of binoculars or a spotting scope can be extremely helpful, um, especially when you're trying to identify birds when they're flying or just a little bit out of your eyesight reach. Um, make sure you're grabbing onto some maps, maps 
of your survey area. Uh, don't forget to bring along any data sheets or survey protocols um, to remind yourself out in the field what you need to do. Um, I always find that it's uh, helpful to have a couple of field guides with me. You know, that way, if you see something, even if it's not your target species in the field, you can flip through there and try to figure out what, what you have. Um, you, it's good to have a vehicle, you know, to get to your survey site. Um, although sometimes if you can do a walking survey down a trail, that works too. Uh, you don't need a camera, but a camera is sometimes nice to have. Sometimes you can see some really cool stuff out there. Um, and be sure to take a look at the weather forecast. Make sure, first off, the weather is going to be falling within your protocol limits. And it's also just, you know, better weather means, you know, better opportunity to spot birds. Um, and I can't, I can't iterate enough, just making sure you're familiar with songs and calls. There's plenty of online resources. Um, Cornell Lab uh, has a great website that I like to go to to review my calls and songs. And then finally, if you're going to go out, especially by yourself, make sure you're telling someone where you're going um, and about what time you'll be done and come back or just for safety um, purposes. Or, you know, you might get stuck too and then let that, that happen too. Um, you know, you know, sometimes you can bring a friend along. I like to bring my, my dog along. He keeps me company and he's, you know, he's going to help me find what I'm looking for. So for me as a pheasant survivor biologist, there are a handful of species that are very, that I have surveyed for quite a bit. Um, in the past, I have done a couple of songbird, grassland songbird surveys, but now in my current role, um, these are some of the species that I most commonly survey for. Um, the first one being ring neck pheasants, um, bobwhite quail, um, and then grouse, um, which includes our two grouse species in Nebraska, which is the greater prairie chicken and sharp-tailed grouse. Now, in general, the reason why we are surveying for these species is, you know, to, they're good indicators of the local habitat types. And we're also kind of interested in some local and large scale trends of, of each of those species. Um, in many cases, we're working with landowners. They, they may be interested in what the quail are doing in their local area. These surveys are a great way, great way for us to be able to connect with those people and give them an idea of what's going on. So for a pheasant, we do what's called the pheasant crow count. They, they have a song that kind of goes like a crow, like a rooster. Um, typically, we're doing these sorts of surveys in the months of April, May, April and May. And we're doing these at sunrise. So typically, a protocol is going to be you can start the survey about 45 minutes before sunrise um, until about 9 o'clock. And a, crow, a pheasant's going to crow roughly once every two to three minutes. And so really, you don't really need to stay in one spot for, for more than three minutes. And you're, you're, you're typically going to be able to capture any rooster pheasants uh, that are in that area. Then you're going to drive on to maybe down to another mile or, or two or so and, and survey for another location. Oftentimes, uh, when we're doing uh, pheasant crow counts, it's not hard to do at the same time um, surveys for other bird species such as their habitat. So things like eastern meadowlark, uh, loggerhead shrikes, um, or even bobwhite quail. Um, that brings me to the next one, bobwhite quail whistle counts and covey calls. Because those, those, there's two times in survey uh, bobwhite quail. Uh, the first time would be spring whistle counts. And those were actually, you know, kind of start a little bit later, you know, maybe more in June. Uh, and you're listening for the, the typical Bob White call of the males. Um, these, are, again, are usually done at sunrise. And these are also just like pheasant crow counts. They can overlap, listen to overlap for other calls. So again, you're staying in one spot for a, only a couple of minutes. And you're going to be going doing multiple stops in one morning. So same thing, you know, 45 minutes before sunrise to you know, maybe about 9 a.m. And that's going to be the most active time these guys and many of the others, grassland songbirds, are going to be making calls. Another time that you can do a, a bobwhite quail counts is maybe for a more localized area. So if you are looking, say, at your own property, you're kind of curious what, um, how many quail you have, you can do what's called a fall covey count. And this is going to take place typically in October. Again, we're going to be doing it about 45 minutes to sunrise to about a half an hour after sunrise. So roughly an hour and a half in the morning. 
And you're actually going to sit in one spot for this entire time. And you're going to listen for what's called the Covey call. Now, this is different from the Bob White call. It's more of like a cooey, cooey call. And then if you can pinpoint where exactly that call is, you can kind of mark it down on a map or take a mental note. And once the survey period is done, uh, what we like to do is actually try to go out and try to flush the covey and then count how many birds are in the covey. And this really cool, um, if you stick around long enough, if you're able to flush the covey, um, if you wait long enough, they'll start doing their covey call again. And that's how they communicate with each other to covey back up. Um, it's, it's really fun. Uh, it's really exciting. And I will say, having your trusted uh, bird dog with you to help you flush the coveys has proven to be a lot more effective than just me walking around blindly by myself. Um, but it's definitely a great way to get out in the mornings. You get to see the sunrise. Um, and you get in a good exercise looking for birds. Um, prairie chicken and sharp-tailed grouse. This is another morning survey. And we're doing this, you know, typically in the month of April. Um, and so typically you're going to try to do these in areas where there's either some known legs or some potential legs. So the males of both of these species will do some booming and dancing behaviors. Uh, and these are very elaborate displays to attract the females. And the sound actually comes from the air sac. So you can see in the bottom picture of that. Uh, sharp-tailed grouse, there's kind of a purple air sac on his, on his throat. The sound is really coming and vibrating from those areas. So um, these sounds can carry for a long way. So even if you're just out in the morning driving around, you know, you might be able to hear it in the distance and then drive close to it. Um, and again, the best time for these is, is sunrise. So some other bird surveys that are easy to do um, are again your grassland birds. So if you're able to go out to any local WMAs or if you have uh, you know, some grasslands, you could survey these from the road. Um, these, are, these are fun surveys to do. I've done several of these, you know, things like dig sizzles, uh, upland sandpipers, meadowlarks, bobblewinks. They all have some very unique calls, you know, especially in that June and July time frame. Those are some good times to get out and look for grassland bird. Uh, waterfowl can also be um, extremely fun surveys to conduct as well if you're able to get out to a wetland site um, during the spring and fall migrations. You know, you're able to kind of glass the water and see what kind of species are out there. Now this is, you know, a lot of getting out and about, but you can certainly do your own bird surveys, you know, along trails in town or just walking trails. Um, and you can also just conduct your own surveys if you have bird feeders, you know, just keep a tab of uh, what kind of birds are visiting your bird feeders during what times of the year you might be surprised to see. You might have a couple of migrants coming through, which is very exciting. Um, and really, I find, you know, having a bird feeder outside of a couple of my windows here in town, um, I've become a lot better at my bird ID, which has really related to when I do go out in the field. Um, I'm a lot more confident in what I'm looking at. Um, and regardless if you're out birding or doing official bird surveys, if you're able to see a bird that has a band on it, um, do your best, you know, take pictures and use binoculars, be patient. If you're able to get the band number or the band combination off of those and get, get those reported, um, it's extremely, extremely helpful for biologists to figure out the life history of those things. Um, look, several years ago, I did get the band number off of a snow goose and um, I sent it into USGS, US Geological Survey, and they actually sent me a certificate, official certificate. And I found out that that bird had been banded uh, like 14 years prior. So um, it's really cool. The, the, you know, you can really find out some information about that bird. Um, it really makes it really personal for you. So um, these things are very fun to do if you're able to do that. And last but not least, um, these bird surveys are really meant, you know, it's a good way to get out, get some fresh air, and uh, don't stress over it. Get out there and just enjoy um, learning something new about some animals that we love and uh, have a lot of fun. Take some friends, take the kids with you. Um, these are definitely activities everyone can do um, and just have fun. So uh, that's everything I have for the time being. Um, I hope you enjoyed the presentation and. If you can, don't you know? Feel free to reach out and uh, 
get out and find some birds.